All right, um, this is our last uh, lecture for the course. Um, you can cheer if you want to, but um, this is going to be um, a really good one, I think. Um, this is uh, very much applied, and um, I'm really excited to, to look at some of these problems. Um, and we're going to actually start with a familiar one. Um, you know, basically, this the topic, as it says, is optimization, and, and basically all we're doing is finding uh, maximums and minimums of a function. So if you go back and look at what we've been doing, finding maximums and minimums on a closed interval, or finding local extrema on, on the um, domain of the function, right? Uh, those are the same techniques we're going to be using now. So we're really doing the same thing, we just have to get uh, the, the problem set up, get the function and the domain over which we're um, finding the maximum and minimum figured out. So with that being said, there was two ways of finding max and mins. On a closed interval, right, we had what technique? If we have a continuous function on a closed interval, we're guaranteed a max or min. And the way we do that is we find the critical points, and then we go and simply check the value of the original function at the endpoints and at the critical points. And one of those uh, values will be the max and one will be the min. So I mean the function is continuous, right? So that's what we did, and that was in section 4.2 in the book. And then the other technique was if we have an open interval or an unbounded interval, uh, like the, the domain of the function is all real numbers or something, then we're going to have to go back to the first derivative test. And so we're going to, or you could use the second derivative test as well, uh, to find the, the local extreme values. So there we're going to right, do a sign check on the first derivative and determine where the location of local max and mins are and then based on the problem information and, 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 and the domain we'll be able to, to determine what the actual max and min for the function is. Okay, Sometimes uh, either function, either method can sometimes be used um, but um, we'll, we'll, I'll kind of illustrate that as we go through the problems and remind you when we're using the, the various techniques. So let's go into it, let's look at this problem this one is actually pretty familiar because um, we uh, actually do a problem like this in pre-calculus uh, because the function we're going to obtain is simply a pro, uh, uh, quadratic function which the graph is a parabola and um, if you remember how to find the vertex of a parabola you can find the, the max or min of such a function but we're going to use the calculus to do that and then that will help us as we look at other more interesting functions Okay, so a rancher has 2,000 feet of fencing to enclose a rectangular field. So we're going to enclose a field for cattle or for livestock or whatever, I don't know. Um, assuming he uses all the fencing, what are the dimensions of the field that will maximize the enclosed area? So on these problems, you're going to have to uh, come up with a function and uh, to, to maximize, in this case, and you need to make sure you declare what your variables represent. Okay, And so when I'm thinking of this problem, in order to do that, I'm going to you know, look at drawing a, a picture of what? A you know, rectangular field, right? What would it look like if we were far above that rectangular field and we had, when we're looking at the fencing, it would look just like a rectangle, right? From far above. And so there's our rectangle. And what are the dimensions, right? It says the question is, what are the dimensions of the field? What are the dimensions for uh, a rectangle? And they're the length and the width of the rectangle, right? So we need to define those two quantities. We need to assign variables to them. And I'm just going to let this, uh, this length be x. And I guess we'll call this the width of the rectangle y. So there's that. And then, of course, the other thing was we're going to maximize the enclosed area. So I do need to state something like this, let uh, A equal the uh, area enclosed. So don't assume I know what your variables represent. Clearly either label a diagram with your variables or state with a brief statement what they represent. Okay. Of course the dimensions for our variables X and Y will want to be in feet. What's the area dimensions going to be? Square feet, right? Okay, so x and y are in feet. 
uh, and areas in square feet. Okay, and now we need an equation relating these variables. What's the equation that relates this variables? Well, these variables. Well, we know the area of any rectangle is the length times the width. So I have the function I want to maximize A, and it's a function though of how many variables? Two variables. We need this to be a function of one variable. We've, we're dealing with single variable calculus, right? Function of x, right? Find the maximum for that function. So I need to get this to be a function of one variable. And so with these optimization problems, there is typically a constraint, right? In other words, uh, there's something that's uh, making me, you know, I just can't choose x and y to be anything. And, you know, then then a can be as big as I possibly want. But there is a restriction. What's the restriction? Well, that there's 2,000 feet of fencing, right? We're going to assume that he uses all the fencing, and so we have a, a, a constraint. I'm going to call it the fencing constraint, all right, which says what? The amount of fencing we use is equal to 2,000 feet. Well, what's the amount of fencing in terms of x and y? Well, these are the fences, right, around the perimeter. So let's, let's count it in feet, right? There's what? x feet. There's y feet. There's another x feet and another y feet. So that's x plus x is 2x, y plus y is 2y. So a total of 2x plus 2y, just the perimeter of this rectangle, right? That must be equal to 2,000, right? 2,000 feet. So there's our fencing constraint. Now, notice this equation relates x and y. So I can solve for one of the variables, substitute that into this, and I will have areas of function of one variable. Which variable do you want to solve for? It really doesn't matter in this problem because they're because of the symmetry. I'm going to choose to solve for y, and that way when I replace y uh, with the equivalent expression in x, we'll have areas of function of x. Okay. First of all, I'm going to divide both sides by two, and then I'm going to subtract x. Subtract x from both sides. So there it is. Now I would like to say one thing about this x value. What can x be? What value can x be? Can x be any real number? Well, first of all, x is the length of this fence. So clearly, um, x um, has to be greater than zero. Now, now could x be equal to zero? Um, it could, but we know that would be kind of silly. If x goes to zero, what happens to this rectangle? Y gets longer and longer and longer. If X goes all the way to zero, what's going to happen? We're going to have two fences. Since there's 2,000 feet of fencing, we'll have two fences side by side, 1,000 feet long. Right? That's not a good design for our uh, rectangular field. That's not going to enclose zero area. But I'm going to include that as a possibility because it is possible to configure the fences in that way. Okay, And I'll explain why I want to include that here in a minute. Uh, is there a maximum value of x? Can I just let x get longer and longer and longer without bound? No. As x gets longer and longer, y gets smaller and smaller. In fact, the other extreme is what? I will have two fences side by side, right, horizontally, each of length, what? 1,000 feet. Right? And you can see this in the equation. If I let y go to zero, what is, what I'll have? Two times x is 2,000, or x is equal to 1,000. And so, that is sort of the possible range for x in this problem. Okay, so I need to put in the, the uh, constraint from the problem on this. And now I'm going to take this information, and I'm going to plug that in for y. And so when I do that, what do I get? I get area is x times y, but y is 1,000 minus x. Let me go ahead and distribute this x through. All right, 1,000 x minus x squared, and this is valid for x, again, we said between 0 and 1,000. So now, okay, now what do we have? Just basically, we're trying to find the maximum area. So I want to find the value of x that maximizes this function on this interval. All right, so now it just becomes a purely math problem that we've done before. What type of interval do, interval do we have? Is it a closed interval that includes endpoints? Or is it an open interval not including endpoints? Or, or is it an unbounded interval going to infinity? 
answer, it's a closed interval, right? Because I chose to have these endpoints. Now I know something about the area <clears throat> at each of these, right? <clears throat> the enclosed area, excuse me, <clears throat> goes to zero. Okay, so I can do this by that technique of finding a maximum on a closed interval. What do we need to do? We need to check the function at the endpoints and at the critical points. So I need, I have the endpoints, I need critical points. How do I need, how do I get critical points? I need the derivative of the area function with respect to x. What's the derivative of this? Real easy. I get 1,000 derivative of x squared. It's 2x. A piece of cake there. And I think we can clearly see that this derivative is clearly never undefined, but it is zero when x is how much? You can solve that equation, right? x has to be 500, right? 2 times 500 would be 1,000, and that derivative would be zero. Okay. Um, now, some of you know about symmetry. You know the graph of this function is, a, is a, indeed a parabola. Right, and because the x squared term has a negative coefficient, it's a downward opening parabola. You know, so if I were looking at the graph of this uh, function, a now as a function of x, right, then um, the graph is going to be at zero at zero, and at one thousand at zero, and um, you know we're just restricting on this domain. The graph is upward, a downward opening parabola, so it's going to come up and come back down, all right? And and we, we kind of already see the, the critical point, right? Right, right here, um, at 500. Okay. And and we don't graph the rest of the problem that goes down. We're, we're not including those values, right? Those are outside the domain for this for this problem. Okay. We already know where the max is going to occur at, but let me just for completeness' sake. In general, this is what you would do in this case, right? Given the value uh, of the uh, function here, we want to evaluate it at the endpoints and at the critical points. So the endpoints were 0 and 1,000, right? So those are the endpoints. And then our critical point of, of 500. Right. We already know the area is 0 at these. I mean, you can plug in. Uh, x is a 0, and obviously x is a 1,000, and you're going to get 0 in both cases. What happens when you plug in 500? I plug in x is 500, I get 1,000 times 500 minus 500 squared, which is equal to 250,000. Okay? And we're guaranteed the max and min, so obviously this is the max, the minimum is 0. Right? In fact, we know right here, right, that the y coordinate of this vertex is 250,000. So again, um, there's our maximum, right? We're, we're showing the support has to be shown either this way, uh, right, with a table, or we'll see in the, in the other cases with a sign check on the derivative. Okay. Now, what was the question again? This is, don't forget what we're looking for. What? are the what dimensions of the field that will maximize enclosed area what were the dimensions x and y what have we found we found just the value of x to maximize right x is 250,000 oh, sorry x is 500 the area is 250,000 square feet in that case but what's the value of y when x is 500 well remember the relationship we have between x and y is right here so when x is 500 feet y is 1,000 minus whatever x is, also 500 feet. So the dimensions that give the max enclosed area are 500 feet by 500 feet. X and Y, X equal that, Y equal that. And what's the actual maximum area? We weren't asked that question, but sometimes you will be. The actual maximum area is, is right here, right? The maximum area is that in square feet. So, 
this problem again, a lot of you have seen this, and again, you have the graph as a parabola. A lot of you could have used the techniques we learned to find the, the vertex of a parabola. Um, let's take a look at, um, oh, and let me just say this, a pretty important thing is that um, we have the maximum area when what shape, x and y are equal, what kind of rectangle is this? It's a square, right? So it is true that indeed if you have a fixed perimeter, which is basically what we have, a fixed amount of fencing gives us a fixed perimeter, then the area enclosed is maximized when the configuration is such that we have x and y, the length equaling width or a square. Now, there are variations on this problem that you will work on. One is, uh, what if we have a like a straight river running through our property, and on this side we don't need a fence here, right? So let's suppose there's a river running here, and this fence is not needed because the cattle they they don't swim, they won't get in the water. That's sort of a natural boundary. Or maybe we have this straight cliff face or something. We're out west somewhere, and there's a, 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 a what is it a butte or a mesa? I don't know. You know, high cliff wall rising straight up, right? So we don't need a fence right on here. In that case, would the amount, uh, would the area that we can enclose be different, the maximum area? Same amount of fencing. And, and would the configuration of X and Y be such that we um, have a uh, square? Well, let's just do that problem real quick. I just think it's worthwhile to look at. So here we have a river, we'll say, natural boundary. I'm just modifying this problem. Uh, everything's the same except for this. So now when I draw my rectangle, here it is. Again, this is the Y length, and this is the X length. My area is still X times Y. But this time when I do my fencing constraint, it was 2X plus 2Y is 2,000, right? What is it now? Well, how much fencing do I need? I have X, X, that's 2X, but how many Y? Just one Y. I don't need this Y length here. So 2X plus Y equals 2,000. And if I solve for y, um, oh, sorry, I kind of changed variables on you, didn't I? This was y and this was x. Now this is y and this is x. Okay, it's okay. I can do that. I'm free to do that. Okay. If you want to call this y and this x, that's fine. Um, but I'm going to solve for y here by subtracting 2x. Okay. Now, um, we did this before. What's the, what's the value of x limited to? The smallest x can, can be again is zero, and that would be kind of dumb. As x gets smaller and smaller, this y length gets longer and longer. In the extreme, as x goes to zero, we end up with a fence that's 2,000 feet long, running right along the river bank. Okay, that's kind of dumb. Okay. The other extreme is what x gets bigger and bigger, y gets smaller, and again we have two fences perpendicular to the river both what 1,000 feet length. So x again is between 0 and 1,000. y though is between 0 and 2,000 in this configuration. Right? So again I take that information and plug it in there and I get the area is x times y is 2,000 minus 2x or 2,000 x minus 2x squared. Right? Um, and again, those are my endpoints, 0 and 1,000. I take the derivative this time. I get 2,000 minus what? 4x. 1,000 minus 4x. Well, again, when is this derivative equal to 0? What's the critical point? When is 4x equal to 2,000? When x is, again, 500. You say, hey, it's the same thing. It's the same thing. x is 500. Right? Not quite. Uh, we, we have the same basic idea here when I look at um, the area function at the endpoints. Right? Again, it's zero, those, those two. This time when I plug in 500, if I plug it into this, this formula, I get 2,000 times 500 minus 2 times 500 squared. Right? Plugging it back into the area, area function here. This was the derivative down here. I'll plug it back into the derivative, you'll get zero, all right? So I plug it in here, and this comes out to be 500,000. 
Uh-oh. I've, I've enclosed what? Remember last time it was what? 250,000? Right? This river has allowed me to double the enclosed area. Double. That's the maximum area. And it occurs when X is 500 feet. But notice, right? Uh, so the max is uh, when X is 500 feet. And Y is what? Well, remember the relationship we have up here, 2,000 minus 2x, 2,000 minus 2x, 2,000 minus 1,000, y is 1,000 feet. And so, no, it's not a square that maximizes the enclosed area in this case, because one of our sides is, uh, you know, we don't need uh, fencing along that one side along the river. Okay. So, we have modifications on this problem. Sometimes we what if we were to enclose two corrals? You know, we might need to share a fence in between them. And you'll see some variations on this problem. Okay? But these problems are easy in the sense that they are very much like um, what we saw with parabolas in pre-calculus. Let's look at a more interesting problem where the calculus is going to come into, into uh, usefulness. And what we're going to do is we're going to find the dimensions of a 12 ounce soda can that will maximize the surface area. All right, if you drink a can of soda, Coke or Sprite or Mountain Dew or whatever, I don't know, they're usually in 12 ounce right, size. Now, it's the, a can is, a soda can is not a perfect uh, cylinder. You know, the top and the bottom have crinkles and different cuts and everything. Um, but we're going to assume it is, just for simplicity here. So that's what we're going to assume, right circular cylinder. So what's a right circular cylinder look like? It's a three-dimensional object here. I'm going to try and draw that on two-dimensional sheet of paper, so dashed lines we can't see behind there, right? So it's a cylinder, right? And uh, if I slice it at any point, I, the cross-section is a circle. So when we talk about the dimensions, right, uh, what are the dimensions again? What dimensions are we talking about now? Well, we're talking about the what we will call the height of the can, call that H, and this base uh, cross-sectional area is uh, determined by the radius. We'll call that R, right? The radius or the diameter we could use too, but we'll use the radius. Okay. Now, 12 fluid ounces uh, is typical in a can, but when we're talking about dimensions. Uh, ounces, fluid ounces doesn't help me good with the units for dimensions. So I'm going to change from uh, a volume measure of fluid ounces to a volume measure of cubic inches. And here's the conversion. You can go online and find a unit converter to convert fluid ounces to cubic inches. So 12 fluid ounces is about 22 cubic inches. So we'll, we'll just route it to that. Now, uh, Ma minimize this time. Look, this is not a maximize problem. It's minimize, right? So, all right, how can we, can we do this? Well, the can has to have the same volume. So if you think about it, if I let H be bigger, then the radius is getting smaller, and we get a we get a narrow can, right? Think about the long extreme. We got a you know a, a can that's real uh, long and, and and narrow, looking more and more like a straw or something like that. The other extreme is H gets smaller, radius gets bigger and bigger, and we get flatter can like a tuna fish can or something. Okay, so let's uh, let uh, S equal the surface area. I'm gonna have to change pens here. That one's dying on me. And again, surface area is the area of the exposed surfaces of the can, not the interior, but the exposed. So the exposed has the top and the bottom and the side. So let's talk about the top and bottom. If I look at the top and bottom, they are circles, right? And so that's pretty easy part. The area of a circle is pi times what? The radius squared. And the top and bottom gives me 2 pi times the radius squared. So this is the area of the top and the bottom. And I want to add to that the, the sides. Now, I'm going to show you how to get the sides. You know, what, what, what area would the sides be? Well, what I'm going to do is, what if I were to take 
the top and bottom off the camp. Get me a pair of, uh, what do we call those, tin snips. And then take the top and bottom off, and then I'm going to cut down the side here, and then I'm going to unroll the can. Right? Cut, cut along the side here, unroll the can. What would you see when it unrolls? You'd see a rectangle. Right? And this dimension is the height of the can. What's this dimension here? What's the length of this rectangle going to be? Does anyone know what that is? Think about where's this length come from. It's going to be the distance around the circle, right? Or what we call the circumference. Does anyone know how to find the circumference of a circle of radius r? The circumference is pi times the diameter. The diameter is 2r, and so it's pi times 2r, or sometimes we'll write 2 pi r, right? So there it is, and so area of this rectangle was the area of the sides, which is what? Length times the width, or length times the height, 2 pi r h. So there's the sides. Okay. Now you can find a formula by looking online, or I think in our help sheet that we usually use, there's a formula for the surface area of a can. Um, but that's the way that's where it comes from. Now. Notice again, I have surface area I'm trying to minimize. It's a function of two variables, r, the radius, and h, the height. We need it to be a function of one variable. So what is the uh, constraint in this problem? The last problem was fencing. In this problem, it is the volume. Right? The volume is fixed at 22 cubic inches. So we have a volume constraint here. We can't just arbitrarily choose R and H to be as big as we want because the volume must remain 22 cubic inches. What's the volume of this um, what's the volume of this cylinder? Does anyone know how to find the volume of a cylinder? It's just since it's constant cross-sectional area, it's going to be the area of the cross-section times the height. Area of the cross-section times the height. So cross-section is a circle, pi R squared times the height, H. area of the cylinder and that is equal to what do we say 22 cubic inches so in cubic inches that's important because if it's in cubic inches then our lengths will be in what inches our lengths will be in inches All right, so I have square inches for r squared inches for h that's a cubic inches okay so what do I want to do now I want to solve for r h and I want to plug it back into this formula so which one do you think you'd rather solve for h or r now, either way you go is not wrong, but there is a much easier way. Should you solve for H, or should you solve for R? Well, I would solve for H. Two reasons why. Number one, in solving for R, I'm going to have to take the square root. Ugh. Yucky. And, when I plug back in, I've got two places to plug in for R. If I solve for h, I don't have to take the square root, and I only have one place to plug in. A little bit easier. I'm going to solve for h. How do I solve for h? It's this times h equals 22. Simply divide 22 by pi r squared. We'll solve for h. Now, what's the value of r in this case? Well, r, in this case, can r be 0? Remember we were talking about in the last one letting x and y be 0, and we had just fences side by side. Is it possible for r to be 0 in this problem? No. Look at the volume constraint. The volume must always be 22. If the radius goes to 0, our can diminishes, the volume diminishes to 0. Right? If I plug in 0 here, I get 0. And so R cannot be 0. R is some positive value, right? So R is greater than 0. Okay? Is there a maximum for R? Is there a maximum for R? Well, mathematically, no, because as, as R gets bigger and bigger, H gets smaller and smaller. How small can H get? Well, it can't get zero, but I can get to close, as close to zero as I possibly want. So mathematically, uh, we simply say R is any positive value. So if you pick R to be any value, I can find a value of H that fits. Now, if you go to R is what, what you know, 20 miles. If you have a radius of 20 miles, <laughs> H is like a, a, you know, the distance between, you know, protons and an atom or something. Real microscopic. I mean. Uh, super microscopic level okay but mathematically you can you can do that now uh, so so we're going to take this value of h and we're going to plug it in there 
Okay. This also gives you a little hint about the technique we're going to use. Is that a closed interval or is that a open or unbounded interval? I think it's unbounded, right? Everything greater than zero is zero to infinity. Don't have any endpoints. Okay, so that's going to be important. So when I come back here, I'm going to look at my 2 pi r squared, right, from up here, and then 2 pi r h. h is this thing now, so plus 2 pi r, and h is 22 over pi r squared. Now I can clean this up a little bit if you'll notice. Uh, the pi divided by pi, that's gone. Um, this r cancels with one of these r's. I'm left with one r. And so what do I have for my function? 2 pi r squared plus 2 times 22, 44 over r. And this is valid for r greater than 0. So now the problem is simply this. Find the value of r that makes the function s minimum. What's the minimum value for this function on this interval? So I can forget about everything above and just do the math, right? This is now an open interval. I have no endpoints. So how do I proceed? I'm going to find the derivative, and I'm going to do a sign check on the derivative and use the first derivative test to find the location of any local minimum. Um, and then we'll, we'll talk about you know, how we know that's the absolute minimum on this interval. So let's find the derivative of the function s with respect to r. Remember, r is our variable. So what's the derivative? 2 pi times the derivative of r squared. It's going to be 4 pi r, right? Bring the 2 down. 2 times 2 is 4. And then notice this is 44 uh, over r. And, and the way we're going to think about 44 divided by r, I mean, don't use quotient rule on that. I guess you could. Just think of it as, as that. 44 times r to the negative 1 power. So I bring the negative 1 down. I get negative 44, and then it's r to the negative 2, or 1 over r squared. So there's the derivative of that. Okay, so I want to know when this derivative is 0 or undefined. Notice it's undefined when r is 0, division by 0, but of course we're excluding 0. So uh, we're only going to be looking for when it's equal to 0. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to combine these as one fraction. The denominator here is r squared. So I'm going to multiply top and bottom of this by r squared. So I'm going to get 4 pi r cubed, right, minus 44 over r squared, right? Here's the 44 over r squared. What's 4 pi r cubed divided by r squared? Well, the r cubed and it will cancel with two of the r's, and I'll just left, be left with 4 pi r, right? So I've just combined these as one fraction, finding a common denominator, and then subtracting. Okay. And so from that, I see that the derivative is 0 whenever the numerator is 0. Right. And so let's solve this. This is going to be 4 pi r cubed equal to 44 if I add 44. If I divide by 4 pi, I get r cubed. 44 divided by 4 is 11 over pi. And so r is the cube root of 11 over pi. Cube root of 11 over pi. Now, you know, I always ask for you in general to give me the exact value, right? There's the exact value for the critical point, or critical value. Okay? But here we really want to know what is this approximately. So use your calculator to approximate what this is. And it's about 1.5. Remember the units for R were inches, right? 1.5 inches. Now, it's good that we have only one critical point. But do we know we have a minimum? Well, we need to be careful. We need to prove that. And the way we do that in this case is not by checking the function at the endpoints, because there are none, and the critical point. But we want to find, do a sign check on the derivative, right? And again, the domain was everything greater than zero. So I'm going to include that there. And our critical point, right, was this was about 1.5 inches there. And the sign of the derivative there was 0. And so I just need to check and see what's the sign for values less than 1.5. So let's plug 1 into the derivative here. If I plug in, here's my derivative. If I plug in 1, the bottom is 1 squared is 1. The top is going to be 4 pi times 1 cubed. That's 4 pi. 4 pi minus 44. Well, what's 4 pi? Pi is 3.14. 4 times 3.14, that's less than 13. So a number less than 13 minus 44, that's negative, 
I can plug in and get negative there. So the sign is always negative. Something greater than 1.5, let's plug in 1,000. How about that? That's bigger than 1.5, 1,000. So I got 1,000 squared, that's positive. 1,000 cubed times 4 pi, that's a huge number, much bigger than 44. The difference is positive. Okay. Sign check now tells us what? The very important thing that what? What do we have here? Sign changes in the derivative from negative to positive. That means the function s, the original function, changes from what? Decreasing to increasing, which means that s is indeed minimized um, when r is about one and a half inches. Those are the units, little double tick marks, right, for inches. So s is minimized when r is about one and a half inches. And we know this is the this is the only extreme value, and so the function is going to be going down, 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 right? And then, okay, my computer froze up there, sorry. So at about one and a half inches, we can then turn to increasing. So that's the only minimum, and that's the, the minimum on the entire domain. So it's a local minima, but it's also the minimum value on the entire domain of the function. Now, when r is 1.5 inches, what other dimension do we need? We need to know the dimensions. I need to know what r and I need to know what h is. So how do I get h? Well, here's the relationship, right? And so uh, let me just show you in the calculator how I obtain these values real quick in closing. The value of r was the cube root of 11 divided by pi. So if I do, uh, I'm going to do the one-third power. So 11 divided by pi uh, raised to the one-third power. Some of you might have a cube root button in the calculator. You can use that. That's where I got about one and a half, right? And then I want to figure out what the value of h is. And so the way I'm going to do that, I'm not going to round off this value. I'm going to do, do the answer button for r. So I'm going to do 22 divided by, in parentheses, pi times answer squared. And the value of answer is going to be this value of r, right? So this will be my value of h. And that's about 3 inches. That's about 3 inches. And so s is minimized when r is about 1.5 inches and h is about 3 inches. And we can actually find the minimum surface area if we want to by plugging in uh, you know, this value of r into the original function um, here and we can get the surface area in, um, in in square inches, right? The surface area is in square inches. The volume in cubic inches, surface area in square inches. And these dimensions in, of course, just inches. Now, um, so uh, what I want to say real quick is think about this can. The radius is one and a half inches, so the diameter is what? Twice that, three inches. The height is three inches. What would the profile of such a can look like if the diameter across the top is three inches and the height is three inches? If you were looking at it from the side, somebody had it sitting on the table, and you look at it, what would you see? A square. Is that the shape you usually see for a can of soda? No. No. So here's my question. Why is the Coca-Cola Bottling Company making their cans in the shape that they are. They're losing money because we've just shown you can minimize the surface area when you have this shape, right? And minimizing surface area minimizes cost, right? Less material for the can. Same volume, less material. And you say, well, that's just one can, but they make millions, billions, I don't know how many cans they crank out, right? So we could save them a lot of money, okay? Well, in the next video, we're going to look at this problem again. But I want you to think about, before you watch the next video, why, that, why this is not really an accurate picture of saving them, them, them money. And there's, there's lots of possible reasons, but one in particular. And so we're going to investigate that particular reason in the next video.